Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to this bonus episode of Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris and this is Chris. Hello. <laughs> uh, this today is an unstructured discussion. Uh, we figured we would give you a little treat um, and also maybe treat ourselves to one positive recording before we begin recording for season yeah, nine. This is how we're easing back into things for season nine. We haven't talked about a terrible book in months, I believe. Yeah, we finished everything in the first week of July. And then we were off for a blissful four months. <laughs> I was into now, it. I like it. And now it's um, j- almost mid-November, and we've begun. We've begun reading for season nine, and um, to assuage some of our misery, we figured, yeah, let's do a little bonus and and send it out uh, at the end of season eight. And um, yeah, we just thought we would talk about some nice stuff. So namely, we wanted to talk about. All of the good stuff we read, or in my case, just all of the stuff we read. <laughs> we were Turns off. out, <laughs> when you don't have to read terrible books, like week after week, month after month, there's room for some pleasant experiences. Yeah, sometimes. I, I had very few. But uh, in any case, I read a lot of other books that were not for the podcast, which was nice. Yeah, so just a real, real relaxing, casual day. I don't know. This is just a good media episode, a good cozy yeah. fireside Get chat with Get Chris and Get your blankets. Paris. Dress up like the sleepy time tea bear. That's what I'm going <laughs> to do. Even if you're listening to in the middle of the summer, just you, you have to do it. It's required by law. Yeah, get cozy um, in the summer. I don't know how you get cozy. Do you have the little hat? Do you have like the little sleepy time <sighs> No, bear? I need that, They have that, a name though. for those, right? There's, there's got to be some Victorian. Ken D would know. Yeah, Ken would know. A sleeping cap? Perhaps? Yeah, that's probably just... Why do you need a hat to sleep? Well, uh, I mean, for people like me with curly hair, you actually should sleep with your hair protected in like a scarf or a, a silk or satin hat. Fair. As a baldy, yeah. I wouldn't know that. Well, and it's better for, you know, and no matter what kind of hair you have, really, but um, namely curly hair is the, the most evil of all types of hair. But you <laughs> so... see on like Scrooge in A Christmas Carol and he's bald, like, right? Like, well, he, maybe, what do you need it for? Well, I guess, all right. Think about when you get in a bed and you pull the covers up and how they don't cover your head. I think that's the problem. I think, okay. yeah. All right. I, fine. All right. I'll, I'm not going to let this one go. We have books that are actually good to talk about. So we're yeah, not Chris, wear a hat to bed. Is what <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, I don't know. What do, uh, what do you have for good books? What did you read that was good during our break? During... I mean, so I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a sophisticated reader. I, for pleasure, I yeah, read. Yeah, I probably wouldn't say that either. <laughs> I'll take that because <laughs> basically all I read when I'm reading for pleasure is science fiction and fantasy. Yeah, that's that's, fine. that's just what I do. Here and there, I'll read some kind of music or musician textbook or something like that. Like I read Victor Wooten's The Lesson or The Music Lesson, actually, it's called, which I don't know. I, I feel like it had some decent things to say, but it's another very like if you just put your brain in this weird space. That's how you can think about music. It has some help. This isn't in the good category. It's actually something that I think maybe you should read. Just and, something you experience. Yeah, and perhaps it might end up on an episode of TBC. Victor Wooten, extremely great bass player. Great music educator, too, on top of that. It's just like the way he presented things in this book was a little weird. It's like he has this imaginary music teacher that shows up at his apartment, and he's not sure if he's real or not. 
and he's that's, really weird. That's weird. I don't like, like that. And he just like shows up to give him weird music lessons that aren't about like playing bass. He's like, let's go outside and look at the leaves and shit. Like, man, I fucking hate <laughs> when people are like, I'm gonna teach you how to do something, but I'm gonna write a little story about it. It's like, no, I don't need the story. Cut the shit. The story's gonna suck. Just tell me what you need to tell me. I, I, just... I think Victor's whole <laughs> thing is like, you're, you know, music education sometimes is too. I don't know what the word would like. You get too square from it. Like you go to Berkeley and like everything is just like. Yeah, I'm a recovering classical flutist. I flautist, flutist. I'll fight. I'll fight you out back behind Denny's about it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, as a recovering classical musician, I understand that very much. But yeah, yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to choke people's. You know, that's the point of that book. It's perhaps something I need to think about more. I would not put it in the, like, I had a fantastic time <laughs> reading that pile. So it's you had not a time. Even, you had a time reading it. I had a time it. reading it, but it was an interesting read. Point being is I don't always just read sci-fi and fantasy, but I do, that is most of what I read. So I read a lot of fantasy, actually, this year. Like, a lot. Um, I read China Miavel's The Scar. So we both read Perdido Street Station. Yeah, I actually read that earlier this year. Somehow I squeezed in a whole ass good sci-fi fantasy book amongst the terrible ones, and I really liked it. I read Perdido Street Station ages ago, like a decade plus, so I only have a vague memory of really what's going on in there besides a lot of cool, unique, interesting fantasy ideas, which is what we're always clamoring about on all the fantasy book episodes is like, why aren't you actually fantasizing and coming up with some cool ideas? Yeah, and somehow there was like sex with an anthropomorphic bug woman and I was still on board. Like, still managed to keep me, and you know how much I hate sex with weird animals. I'll be honest with you, there's a little bit of still in the scar, <laughs> so maybe trying to be available has like a very particular thing that he's fantasizing I mean, I... about. <laughs> <laughs> but th- that being said, I, I guess I just want to say that, you know, I still... St- Stood on the train and got to the got to the station at the end right, like if you <laughs> because it was a, so good. If you give me a compelling reason to care about the bug lady sex, then sure, I'm not just gonna. We're not Puritans, as though we even though we come across as that yeah. sometimes. The Massachusetts does come out yeah, quite a bit, but like, sure. yeah, look, man, if you can get me to give a shit about your book, even though your main dude's fucking a scarab, like you've done it. Congratulations. <laughs> Anyways, I think the scar was less good than oh, Pretty yeah. Street Station. I, so Chris very kindly gifted me a digital copy, and I just it just felt too daunting to start. But I I am planning on reading it this year. So it was enjoyable to read for the most part. Um, China Mavell's weirdness is out on full display. There's like an island of mosquito people. There is a, the whole book takes place on a floating city. It's just a bunch of boats strapped together to create a city. Oh, so we wrote Waterworld, but better? Yeah, essentially, okay, yeah. And like, I think the characters are compelling. Um, pretty funnily enough, there was a character named Tanner, which was pretty funny. Oh, considering. Right. And then the other main character was Bellis, but I just said that's Paris in my head. <laughs> Because she's very <laughs> academic and bookish and, like, cares about organization and stuff like that. Oh, no. So, like, those are the two main characters. Great. Now I'm going to read it and think, oh, this is about me and my spouse. Uh, well, they don't like each other, really, <laughs> through most of the book, I'll be honest with you. They have an interesting relationship. It's not just, like, I fucking hate you all the time. It's not I like you all the time. They have reasons to be in the same boat and then not in the same boat. That's a funny joke because yeah. it's a boat. Yep. It's a I, city yep. boat city. Yep. We all, we're all there with you, Chris. Okay, great. We got it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I mostly enjoyed it, except I feel like there was a lot of sections where that were just meandering in terms of China Mavell just like sort of really getting into the deep lore of his city and like why there's a vampire over there and like a little bit of too much <laughs> yeah. weird stuff in there yeah. that I feel like he could have carved out maybe about 100 pages worth of it. But it's still got that unique flavor that China Mavell has. And I think it interesting that I say I think I think it was making an interesting point about how you respond to trauma the, mm. the scar and like how it molds your personality depending on if you choose to ignore it and try to move forward or take it full on and let it kind of subsume you in certain ways and like it's a, it's about a like a lot of how traumatic events can drive people yeah, I think that's a great concept for especially that setting. I mean, I know you explained to me that it wasn't a direct sequel. It was sort of just like, you know, the scar was in the same universe as yes. Perdido Street Station, but doesn't include any of the main characters and sort of goes off on its yeah. own, which yeah. I think is a great idea. I really 
I, oh man, maybe I don't want to talk too much about things that I hate, but I just am sort of tired of all these authors trying to spin out this story into like three or four books just to make a buck. And I know the real evil is capitalism. We, we always talk about this, but like it is a little tired when you get to the end of a first book in a series and you're like, well, they could have wrapped that up, but I see they've spread it out across many more books that I now have to purchase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it is refreshing to see an author say, you know what? Here's my whole idea. It's done. I still like this world, though, so I'm going to write this other thing. And that's cool. I don't know. So I'm looking forward to reading The Scar, even though I know you said you, you know, you liked it. Maybe didn't love it, but maybe liked it. Maybe a 7 out Above of 10. Above average, 7 out of 10? Say. Yeah. yeah. Would, okay. Maybe even an 8, depending on what oh. day you catch me on. All depending right. Depending on what right. day you catch me on. All right. 7 or 8 out of 10 from now, Chris. what I really liked, I am a fan of... Of the Dark Prophet series. Speaking of capitalism, Prophet as in P-R-O-F-I-T. Oh yeah, you've told me about this series. It sounds really good. Orconomics, Son of a Lich, and Dragon Fired actually came out like a couple of months ago. Yeah, I remember you were like, oh, that, that book came out. We're off. I'm going to read it. And I was like, look at you. Yeah, enjoying myself. <laughs> Having time to read a good book. <laughs> oh, no, when good. it comes out. If you don't, the, the sort of the elevator pitch is it's like, it's a sort of satire-y a series about like fantasy heroes, but it is subsumed in like stock market language and like finance finances. And so for example, in the last book, one of the big inventions was like this one, a uh, Noel lady actually befriended a bunch of tiny little elves, like little tiny elf creatures that like live like brownies. I only know brownies as a delicious treat. So I don't know what do you mean? What oh, you mean by that? Uh, but, brownies are sort of a, a, I don't know, type of elf or elf-like creature, um, and they are very small. So perhaps yeah, that. I guess inspired by that, they're like they're almost termite-like. Like they hide in like your the wood of your cottage, and people like try yeah, to kill them. Yeah, that sounds like a brownie. Yeah. Anyway, she befriends a lot of them, and she figures out that they're actually pretty good at doing spreadsheets. Like if she gives them certain <laughs> commands. <laughs> They can like very quickly fill out a spreadsheet and do calculations. So like the the sort of one of the arcs of the third book is her like using that to do detective work to find out like where this weird financial thing is really coming from. God, this is like this is like the nerdiest shit. I love this. It, honestly, it sounds dry, but it's funny as fuck. No, I know. So Chris, I didn't read it, but Chris did send me several screenshots of pages and. I thought the jokes were pretty clever and actually gave you a chuckle, especially if you, too, listener, are an adult currently being crushed by the American capitalist system. It's got something to say about that stuff. It kind of ends in, like, very standard fantasy fairways, which oh, I wasn't like, yeah. okay, there wasn't, like, a fantastic ending here. But the whole ride all the way through, I love all the characters. It's funny as hell. That You know, it doesn't have to be profound. That's another thing that I think sometimes we come across is, like, everything has to be unique. and No, this was just funny and well done. Hey, well, but you know what? We, we've talked a lot on TBC about how we both have a really hard time finding books funny, but you mm. said a lot of this book was funny. And yes. I, I and like I said, the examples I saw I thought were pretty good. So Yeah, I I it's very hard for me to distill down what that quality is because I well here come the reviews saying, Yeah, I bet we're not comedians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No shit. So we're only, you know, like jack of all trades level of kind of being funny, like, okay, I got the plus one on that skill check, but not really yeah, fucking masters of none over here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's us. Anyway, I really I did Son of a Lich, which came out like a couple years ago, but I just didn't ever pick it up. Mm -hmm. But then Dragonfire came out, and I loved that as well. So I so the Dark Prophet series by uh, Jay Zachary Pike. Jay Zachary Pike. He's actually a New Hampshire local. So he's, really, yes, he's nearby. Wow. Yes. Oh God, I hope he doesn't have bad politics in New Hampshire. Well, <laughs> it seems <laughs> judging from the book. <laughs> More than likely not, but who knows? Yeah, who knows? Um, in any case, yeah, cool. Um, other things that I read that I'm not going to spend like a crap load of time on because we want don't want to be here forever. I read. Yeah, we got some Indian food coming. Yeah, <laughs> I read Jade City by Fonda Lee, which is sort of like um, I don't remember this one. It's like Hong Kong gangster, but it's not. T it takes place in a fantasy world. Oh, you did tell me about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's like a little bit kung fu action flick a little bit hong kong gangster film but with like this sort of fantastical element of jade stones make certain people powerful you have to like have a genetic predisposition towards it so like this one island in this fantasy world is full of people that can like 
pin Jane into the like, Jade into their bodies or like carry it or wear it, and it gives them supernatural strength and agility mm. and speed. Okay. If you take too much of it or you take too much of it too soon, it fucks you up and it doesn't work on certain people. So mm. obviously the people that can handle it are like super powered. Just like throw that into your, you know, if you if you like again, Hong Kong gangster kind of feel stuff. Like it does that pretty well. Yeah. It's okay. not amazing, I would say. Decent characters. I like how most of it is written. I wouldn't ever say I was bored during it at all. And the action is well done. Solid 7 out of 10 on that one, I would say. I might pick up the next two books in the series, but I feel like this story was actually self-contained enough that I I'm fine where it is right now. Okay. Um, I also read Kings of the Wild, which is another sort of like satire fantasy thing, except this one is sort of like done as if traveling adventuring parties were given terminology like they were touring bands like you go on <laughs> tour and you have like managers that like you know book you for certain adventures oh, no, Chris, that quests. sounds too real too real to life it is I a know. little bit too real i f i found it slightly worse than the dark prophet series in terms of its jokes it's not as funny the characters aren't quite as great yeah. six out of ten for me but still entertaining ish nonetheless pretty generous D though. yeah de decently well crafted i know we're like i'm not really giving in-depth reviews okay i'm just giving things that I thought were no, I know. Good. I have I have little I have a couple sentences for all the stuff I read. So. I also read Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter, which is like African style fantasy, oh, but it's sick. very it's very gladiatorial. It's very much about this one guy who comes from this village, and the whole society is based around who fight good and who's strong, and so he goes through like gladiator trials, and I mean. I liked that the setting was different from your standard Euro fantasy stuff. So that actually kept me interested. Yeah, yeah. For even sure. though the whole gladiatorial thing, I was like, eh, whatever. Mm. Because like I, you know, I've I've watched Dragon Ball Z. That's all I can take for <laughs> like I'm stronger, I will train. It's very much like he, this dude comes from a poor village and he will train to be the strongest. Like that is Oh yeah, that wouldn't interest me. That's though. the deal yeah. there. But again, the the setting and the trappings are interesting and unique enough to me just because i haven't experienced enough of that culture yeah, yeah. so it makes that was the fun part Did of it, it to read was it like afrofuturism and and sort of no an amalgamation of no there's no, no futurism in oh, here whatsoever okay. it is very much like i guess you could say sword and sandals or each style oh, okay. in a way well where i mean africa's a huge continent like did it specify no oh, it's not like africa it's fantasy oh. world Oh, oh, fantasy I'm world sorry, with dragons and stuff like that, okay. but like inspired. The author explicitly says this is inspired by my culture, hmm. so okay. pulling from that kind of thing. I, I don't, I didn't read specifically what culture mm. he is talking. Sort about. Sort of a pan African, you know. I I can't say for sure whether yes or no on hmm. that one because okay. I didn't really dive into like the about the author. To I just read the story and understood that it was inspired by. Oh, again, the author's culture. That is as deep as I went <laughs> okay. with that. Because I just want I, I want to read a story. I want to read a fantasy story. Yeah, yeah. No, anyway. Curious. Also, I would say six out of ten for the same reason. Just like it's fine. It's slightly above average mm -hmm. and it's entertaining. If you want to read about gladiator fights in a slightly different setting, thoroughly recommend. Okay. In that case. Um, I do want to give a big old thumbs down. I know this is the good media episode, but I oh I get a lot of I get a lot of thumbs neutral or down for mine, so it's okay. Um, I'm generally a Brandon Sanderson fan. I'm not going to oh, say yeah, like I'm, I'm super into like yeah. he is the king of like straight down the middle fantasy. <laughs> like nope, really, no just like <laughs> if you want to just have a fantasy time, Brando can do it for you. I'm a fan of the Stormlight Archives. It's not like the most amazing thing ever, but it's compelling enough. And I like me a Shalon and Pattern chapter. Oh, right. I remember you telling me about this. I characters. love me a Shalon and Pattern chapter. So like the other uh, a couple of months ago, he went out like I wrote four books just in my spare time because he's like he's really insane like that. Like he, he just has like spare manuscripts lying around. He's the exact opposite of George R. R. Martin like that. So he's all all uh quantity and maybe not so much quality <laughs> he does an impressive quality for the amount of quantity he puts out i'll give him that but this one that i read was one of those sort of like i just wrote this for fun manuscripts and it shows 
It is called the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. And it's basically like this guy gets he like it, it's transported into like an alternate universe medieval a kid England. In King Arthur's court. Essentially, yes. <laughs> yes. It's like and even Brandon, I think, admits that, yeah, I'm just doing that. Oh, okay. But it's like, you know, there's a company that offers you travel to alternate dimensions and mm. they can like there's a million billion alternate dimensions and they find you one where you can pretend to be a wizard in medieval England or something like okay. that. Okay. And that's the story. And it's, I mean, it's just so down. Like, this one is so down the middle that it just, like, crash lands into the dust because it just assumed that's where the directions were. But the exit changed somewhere along the way. (laughs) And, you know, like in Boston over here when we just decided to change all the exit names the other year. You notice that? All the what? exit, all the all the exit names changed like a couple years ago. On the on ninety three, uh, yeah. On oh yeah, yeah. I did notice several of them. I was like, that's not what that exit used to be. Yeah, but, but now it's that. Anyway, I it's just so bland and average that I was like, okay, this is the bad side of Brandon Sanderson, where you can tell he didn't really think that hard about it. It's got the bare minimum meat on the bones for a story. Like he knows how to craft like the basic moving parts to like, oh, this guy. You, you're going to care about him because he com- came up from a bad background and this is his, like, he was an ex-boxer. That's not what he was, but, you know, like, <laughs> and he had to go down in a fight because his mob boss told him to, uh, to take yeah. the dive and he's that kind of thing. Yeah. Where, and I was just like, man, I I am not into this at all. It was boring, but I finished it because Terrible Book Club has conditioned me yeah. to just see it all the <clears throat> way through. Yeah, really. it's really hard. For me to end up uh, not finishing something, but anyway, I thoroughly recommend the Dark Prophet Saga. Yeah, That's what yeah, I had the yeah, most yeah. fun reading this year. Good, you good. guys should read that if you're into D and D or fantasy novels of any kind or having a funny time. I think like here's the thing: we I think we've read a couple of books in our regular schedule that are kind of trying to do this, but are a little bit aimless about it. And I really like that this one had that targeted, like it's parodying it from the finance angle, which is unique and interesting. Yeah, for sure. Those are my good books that I enjoyed. All right. Um, Mine is going to be more books that I experienced. I had a lot of thumbs downs for mine. High bar over here. You you would thought, I would think that the, the bell curve would get pushed in such a way where you're just like, finally, just any, it's fine. At least it's fine. Thank God. No. So uh, a lot of the books that I read throughout the year that are not for the show are actually for my work book club. Uh, And the work book club is great because we have a rule where we try to keep it around 200 pages. So we read a lot of novellas, short stuff. So it just, you know, makes it more manageable and sustainable. So the book club continues and we just do one a month. So I've read a lot of stuff for that. Um, however, I'm just going to cover the period or like our break period, I guess. Cause that's what you did, right? That was no, awesome. I was including some stuff that I read earlier in the year, but mostly, oh, okay. yes, it was in the break period. I think it is fine to include anything that you did at any point, because it doesn't, as long as it's something good that you like, that oh, okay. you experienced. Well, I can give you some real, just a real quick drive-bys of all the books that I read for book club. Um, and then stuff I read just on Try my own. Try to highlight the good ones to maintain the positive atmosphere <laughs> of this episode. <laughs> well, uh, that's fine. Uh, I was going <laughs> to, let me get my little reading. The app. glass is half full, Paris, but convince yourself that. The glass is there. Um, <laughs> all right. The utilitarian. So... Uh, looks like in January of 2023, for my work book club, we read This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone. I gave it a three out of five. Excellent prose, but it's hard to get me into time travel and romance, no matter what it's cloaked in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's one, bad combo. That's I hate my it. one line. <laughs> yeah, it was it was just an unfortunate pick for me personally. Um, again, excellent prose, really beautiful language, but like ah, the fucking. Fuck the plot. I thought it was dumb. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, an interesting concept to have two authors. Um, I, From what I understand, each author wrote a chapter and they sort of swapped back and forth. And there's two characters throughout it that are sort of leaving each other letters of a kind. So not not an entirely terrible premise. I just I, fuck time travel and fuck romance. I just don't. I don't want it. Fuck out Sorry. later. I mean, shit. Yeah. I wish we, here's the thing. I think you per- maybe I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, actually. But for me, I don't like it when a time travel romance is based around I can change things so they love me. I hate that. 
Outlander isn't that. Uh, Outlander yeah. is just my lover is in the past, and I'm just going to go back there and hang out with him when I feel like it. I, mean, I, I don't fucking get out of That's here. That's a right little there. bit different. No, though. I hate that too. Sorry. It's just not, <laughs> not for me. Anyway, we already talked about Perdido Street Station. Apparently, I finished that in February of this year. Um, I think we may have talked about the short story collection Jagannath by Karen Tidbeck on here. If I haven't, my friend Stephanie uh, lent this to me. I gave it a three and a half out of five. Uh, some stories were great, notably Rebecca, Arvin Pekon, Aunt Britta's Holiday Village, Jagannath, and the final two about the Fey world of excess. The rest were forgettable. So it's a really short, short story collection, it's like a, maybe 100 pages, maybe 92 or something. So honestly, if you're looking for some sort of kind of weird um, Scandinavian inspired stuff, Karen Tidbeck is Swedish. I would check out Jagannath. Again, low level of commitment, right? Short stories. There's like eight short stories in 100 pages. So you're not, you're not, even if you don't like something, you just move on. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I would recommend it again if you are looking for Scandinavian tinged kind of odd stories. Okay. Not explicitly, like uh, horrifying in some ways, but not like, not gore, not, you know, nothing graphic, but things that leave you unsettled there's like a say. whiff of herring in there just yeah like a little yeah just a little of... little tinned herring Look. yeah just a little uh fucking uh uh what am i thinking of um, the thirst rumming? is that what you're uh, thinking so something uh no um hot uh the fermented shark <laughs> That's it's in there. So you're yeah. just catching the scent of it. Just a note of fermented shark. Uh, for a workbook club in April, I guess we read Walking on Cowrie Shells, which is a uh, by Nana Nequeti. I gave this five stars, actually. Fantastic and varied collection that gifts readers slices of Cameroon and its descendants in America. There is myth and magic here, but the focus is on the heart and the struggles of black women. So great short story collection about black women in Cameroon and uh, and in America. I highly recommend that. Um, there were, I feel like there was only one story in the whole thing that I was like, yeah, but a lot of them were so good. Um, I didn't, again, I didn't even pull out specific stories to mention because I think it's worth reading the whole collection. I think it was a little over 200 pages. So again, very doable. Oh, let's see. I'm just going through my Book Mori app. Uh, this is not an ad. It's just a random app I found that I really like to keep track of my reading. <laughs> um, uh, in June, we read for Work Book Club, The Buddha in the Attic by Julia Otsuka. I gave this four stars, and my review was thus. Succinct, pluralistic, poetic writing convention. I learned things. <laughs> if you don't know much about Japanese immigration to the U.S., this is a great read due to its brevity and impact in such a short form. Uh, so it it is about Japanese... Girls and women, mostly girls, though, who came to the U.S. as sort of mail order brides in the early 20th century, where these men, you know, were looking for wives and they sort of this is the first catfishing. Um, I think really like I don't think you can say that's someone's catfished before through like, I don't know, like well, letters. This, well, that's, in, that's in what Europe. I mean. This was this was like there was an industry around this, though, where all the men wrote fake backgrounds for themselves or, or the agency would and then they'd send a picture oh, that was like 20 years whoa, old catfishing from the men's side yes oh yeah intriguing so the men were all like my oh, dear yeah. lady i am a lord of england henceforth returned from the war no no he'd it's show like, up and he's like hi i'm dave I yeah live with my mom exactly so what happens is these guys send these letters with pictures that are 20 years old being like yeah i'm totally 30 and own a thriving fruit farm and then the women get there all the way from fucking japan with no one no no family nothing to their name and they're supposed to marry this guy and turns out he's actually 55 and he lives under an overpass wow like, it took it's... you so long to get here <laughs> <Yeah>. whoa <laughs> wow i've aged <laughs> so much so i mean this is i'm sorry we're we're laughing but this is a, a real and kind of hideous thing that happened and it just follows so many different women and these women are uh you know sort of an, an amalgamation from pulled from uh original sources primary sources but become fictional you know and i just really think um 
Julio Tsuka did a great job of making these people real, even though we only see them for two sentences sometimes. You know, it's really just this kaleidoscope, the shifting landscape do. of experience of all these different women and all the ways they came here from Japan and experienced America. And yeah, it was it was really great. Um, thought it was good. And again, very short. So if you're like, oh, I don't know anything about the relationship between Japanese immigrants and America and America. Well, pick pick up the Buddha in the attic. It was, it was pretty good. I'm finding that I do like it shorter recently. Like I'm not sitting here for the fantasy tomes quite as much. Perhaps we've got the TikTok brain. Is that what's happening? It's like we <laughs> no. all of our attention spans. Um. All right. So moving along to August. So this was during our break. I read. Oh, this one is so bad. Um. Positive so... me good media episode just no, no, no. breeze by. No, I'm I'm just gonna say. I picked up two books when I went to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum this past year. I go pretty much every year, sometimes twice a year. It's a really beautiful museum in Boston. And I was just like, um, I'm on break. I'm having fun. I'm going to buy some books. It's going to be good. And then they were not good. Uh, this one in particular was quite bad. Uh, it's called The Secret Language of Flowers by Jean-Michel Otoniel. And I gave it two stars, and that was generous. Uh, here is what I said. Colonialist overtones, only meanings described are restricted to Judeo-Christian interpretation, needed more context to explain how narrow these meanings are, not worth buying. Was he like, you can see God in the flower. Yes, that is every... the secret language of the <gasps> flower. You see our maker in each petal. Dude, every flower, every flower's backstory is like... Well, it's red because Mary bled on it. Well, it's blue because Mary cried on it. Like, I'm not fucking kidding. Mary, what are you doing? Stop. It's, it's just, You've contaminated all the flowers. Yeah, it's just like, look, I get the white Western world dominates stuff, but there's a whole other globe of different cultures out there who probably have different meanings and ascribe different properties to these flowers and use them in art in different ways. What the fuck? It was just really disappointing. All right. Uh, next one. It was green because Mary puked on it. <laughs> yes, Exactly. All right, next one from my work book club was Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. Uh, I gave this uh, a soft three stars. Oh, shit. I didn't write a comment about it. But all I have to say is that this book was recommended to the book club because everyone said, oh, it's so weird. It's like so weird. And oh, it's so weird. Like that's all the <laughs> Internet and anyone had to say about it. So. I pick it up and I'm expecting something weird and it's it's totally fine. It's a very normal book. It is just about a woman who is who probably has autism or some other sort of different way of experiencing the world, really. It's never stated, but it seems like that's probably what's going on. And it's not weird. It's not weird. I was just so mad you guys at the made end it of it. Weird. It's not yeah, the book exactly. weird, you're weird. So the whole premise of the book is that this woman uh, gets a job at a convenience store and she ends up working there for like 18 years or something. I think she starts working there when she's a teenager and she's still working there when she's in her 30s and it's modern day Japan so everyone thinks it's weird, you know, because she doesn't have like a corporate career and she's not married and she doesn't have kids and people are just like bitching about it all the time and her whole thing is like I, I guess I just identified with the character a lot, which is why I was like, hey, this isn't weird. <laughs> this is... <laughs> yeah, she's just like, it's fine. I'm fine. You're all weird yes, about this. <laughs> exactly. She was like, well, I don't I don't I don't want to work in a office tower. I want to work here. I, I'm good at this I job. I actually really love that, that like everyone that is reviewing this book is like, she's so weird. Why would you be like, it's, it, do you th is that your interpretation of why other people think it's weird? I think so, because it's like, oh, how could someone think that? you know, not the hegemonic design is is okay. And it's like a lot of people feel this way. I just, I didn't think it was weird. Listen, man, I if I could weird. be comfortable working in a convenience store, I guess I'd probably do it. It's just that that's not really a way to be comfortable. <laughs> well, right. So that's the other thing is like, she had the means to, she was fine working there, doing her own thing, eating really bland food. She just wasn't, she like wasn't into food and wasn't into excesses at all and was like yeah i'm fine i live in my little apartment and i'm really good at convenience store i am really good at <laughs> convenience store stuff this is what i want to do there's nothing wrong with that man like if whatever you your be passion happy, is yeah. it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be some crazy skill that everyone respect like if you're really good at stocking those shelves and you feel good stocking those shelves well and she was she was excellent though she did everything in the store always got like the best reviews she was fantastic at it and like 
If she's happy, who fucking cares? Leave her alone. That was, like, <laughs> honestly, if, if you're like, you're the best convenience store manager ever, that is something to be proud yeah. of. So. I, so anyway, I was expecting a bizarre book. Like, and then I just got like, I don't know, this girl works at a convenience store. The end. I don't know. I just didn't <laughs> think it was very interesting. So even though I didn't think it was weird, it was so like bland to me that I was like, I don't know, this is whatever. I would assume that that's part of the mood of the story too. Is yeah, the I, I think that this book would be good if you, you or if the reader was maybe a younger person and had never encountered somebody who doesn't share the ideals of the hegemonic structure, right? So if you're like 14 and you don't know anybody who experiences the world differently, this book might be good, right? Yeah, you then just you're never like, thought oh. about that. Exactly. But I feel like if you're in a, if you're in your 30s or late 20s, like, I don't know. You you'd be surprised. You, yeah, I guess right? you're right. You'd be real surprised. Some well older adults haven't even thought <laughs> about that that way. So Maybe you're right. Maybe Maybe this is just... Maybe I'm just very fortunate to know a lot of people who experience the world in different ways and have different ideas and opinions, including, you know, myself included, I guess. So, um, yeah, I didn't I it was fine. It's pretty short. If you're interested in reading about a woman who is somehow neurodivergent, uh, really likes working at a convenience store, give it a go. I think the weirdest part about it was the um, appendix. So after the story ends, there's some space and then there's a letter that the author wrote sort of in not actually in the voice of the main character. This is like a separate story, but she's also a lady who's in love with a store and she wants to fuck it. And she talks about, she wants to fuck the store. Okay. That was way weirder than anything okay, else. Well, in the story. Well, sure. Maybe that's what everyone was talking about. Is no, like... but it's disconnected, but it's not in every edition. So I don't. Okay. So, okay. Let me ask you that. Are we, are you like grabbing each item in the store and like having your way with it, or are you like going out to like the meters, no, like the I think, utilities? I think she was like, like yeah. against the side of the wall. How yeah, do you yeah, fuck I think, a store? I think she was like, yeah, we're gonna go in the back room. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ruffle up your your uh, stuff on your shelves. And I'm gonna take off my clothes or whatever. I don't. I'm sorry. I'm paraphrasing heavily because so if I want to fuck a store, book. I have to vandalize it. Yeah, I think it's a little. <laughs> yeah, it's a little vandalizing. It's fucking up a store. Yeah. Care. So anyway. Convenience store woman. <laughs> There's right. two convenience store women, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I guess so. All right, next one. Uh, again, for Workbook Club, I read Heavy by Kaisi Lehman. This is an autobiography. Uh, and I um, I was really looking forward to reading it because the author actually spoke at my job. Uh, and I found what he said extremely compelling. I thought he was very... Um, genuine and just i don't know really yeah just very compelling uh in the way he spoke about his life and the struggles of black americans specifically black american men specifically black american men who are trying to exist in academia uh and so i was really stoked to read his um autobiography and i don't know i gave it a soft three stars but this is this is what I said. I tend to dislike memoirs. I just don't find them very exciting or interesting. If you've never read about the life of a black man in America, though, this would be worth reading. So I think specifically if you have struggled with um, weight or eating stuff uh, or if you've had some struggles with, like, physical or sexual abuse, you know, you might find some value in this. But I don't know. I just... I don't know, man. I was I was really bummed because I, I really wanted to love this, especially after hearing him talk. And then I was just like, I don't know. It just didn't hold my attention. And even though, you know, I can identify with some of the traumatic stuff and it does make you feel terrible. It just like there was something about the style of prose that didn't grab me. There was something different about the way he wrote and the way he spoke. And I thought, oh, the way he speaks is going to be the way he writes. But I don't know. I just didn't didn't hold that, my that interest. Line up. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a great um in depth story there, but eh, wasn't for me. But again, I don't really love. I don't like autobiographies in general. Yeah, so I think that's I really feel just like my why problem. are you so not... important? Why, why why did you decide you could write about yourself? Who are you? <laughs> well, I think he he has some important things to say. But sure. The that, other that's my general attitude. Yeah. Here. Same. Like I I don't don't really like autobiographies, and I think or memoirs or whatever you want to call them, and I think. Another thing is similar to convenience store woman. I just feel like a lot of these ideas I already am already aware of, 
and support, you know, the liberation of, of black folks, <laughs> you know? So I, I guess, again, if, if maybe you have never read something like that before, it might be worth checking out. All right. In September, I oh, read... Only in September. I read... They were here before us, a novella in pieces. This is actually by a Boston author uh, named Eric LaRocca or LaRocca, probably LaRocca. Nah. Ah, I went into this so excited and then I gave it a two and a half stars. <laughs> so this is another short story collection. Uh, and this, I'm, I'm going to tell you why I gave it two and a half stars. I appreciated the inclusion of queer and blind characters in the point of view of non-human animals. Still, None of the stories really captivated me, and few of the descriptions or sentences stood out. I wanted this to be more captivating and complex. I I don't I don't think any of the stories are are worth it to pick up the book and read it. Sorry, man. Uh, I'm saying sorry because you're you're near me. You might find me. Um, <laughs> I actually didn't know this author was local um, until I got to the end of the book and there was like a little author bio, and I was like, fuck, <laughs> it's gonna find me. Um, Anyway, I so just to give you some examples of some of the stories, the first, uh, this is a, a horror story collection. And again, I, I did like the idea that each story was sort of, was a, had a non-human animal that was sort of centered or from their perspective. It was a really cool concept. So the first story was about um, some kind of beetle that inhabits corpses. And it's from the beetle's perspective That'd be Ringo. You think Ringo would be the necromancer? <laughs> he feels like he's the necromancer. It took me like a full 10 seconds to have any fucking idea what you're talking about. I was just like, shit, how do I respond? Oh. Maybe Paul. Maybe Paul. <sighs> no. Unless it was I... John and that's why he he was really a lich and that, that guy. I'm not going to make that joke. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I refuse to talk about the Beatles because I fucking can't stand the Beatles. Okay, anyway, we're going to move past moving that. Moving on. But insect beetles yes. fine anyway so this book's from the perspective of a beetle who is inhabiting a corpse and the beetle's like super in love with this decaying corpse uh and it's a uh, wow we gotta put some content warnings on the front of this because i already i already mentioned some stuff that's probably gonna be issue for folks but um the corpse is a young woman who was pregnant and you know baby was kind of far along so yeah, it was pretty okay. weird. After that first story, I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be now into this. Now, there's weird. Yeah, but it wasn't good. Not some good. lady convenience store would just work. That's not weird. This is weird. This is weird, but it wasn't good weird. I didn't I didn't enjoy it. Uh, The second... Shit. I don't remember what... There's a couple... So, whatever. I can't remember all the stories. I'll, I'll pull some that I do remember. There's one that... Probably the best one of the collection was about... This rich guy who had a chimp as a pet, you know, so we're talking somebody with like, you know, this palatial estate and he can have a chimp and whatever. And he dies and he leaves the chimp to his boyfriend. And the story is from the chimp's perspective. And it's not, you know, I think it's good how the author sort of trusts you and sort of lets you in to the fact that you're hearing stuff from the chimp, like slow, you know. It's not like, hello, this is the chimp. It's it's cra it's crafted well. I am chimp chimply. Yeah, chimp. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Yeah. Um, and you but come... why, ooh, and ah. Uh. Yeah, why? <laughs> and you so you find out uh, pretty quickly that the boyfriend and the chimp hate each other. And the reason is because the man who died was fucking the chimp. Uh, and so, See, here's you know... here's a weird book. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that... It creates some complications um, <laughs> because the boyfriend didn't know that. I think he didn't I think, know. yeah, no, he probably wouldn't have stayed. He was like, I guess, I mean, do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, so the boyfriend, who, the the living boyfriend who who the chimp is left to, he doesn't know the chimp and the his ex were fucking, but he doesn't like how, how much his boyfriend, uh, like, catered to the chimp and, and loved the chimp and treated him so well he thought it, he was like oh it's just a dirty animal you know like and the chimp hated that you know he was always put in a cage and like knew they were having sex and was like oh this sucks you know whatever like i want some of that me, dick me up what there the yeah <laughs> but it you know but it's it's told in a more a little bit more compelling way and then it just ends with like the chimp uh i forget if the chimp murders the living boyfriend and then the chimp also dies or is the, the chimp, chimp like oh shit i killed my one source of where food comes from i don't 
quite remember. But anyway, that was like the one that was probably the best out of the whole collection. I again, not, uh, not my favorite, but at least a different idea, you know. And then yeah, the final sure. story, uh, which um, features a blind character, which I really appreciated. Again, the inclusion of like you know differing perspectives was pretty good in this. I thought I thought that was well done. But yeah, no, we don't not really get in the chimp perspective that often yeah like i really thought you know a beetle a chimp uh in this last one there's a snake you don't get its perspective but it features heavily in the story um there's a father and his son and they're in the car i forget i think i think they're uh the dad the other dad um i think one dad's in the hospital and the other dad is like taking the kid back home after they went to visit you know his husband or whatever and the kid is blind um and the kid had found this little snake, like a really small, maybe a garter snake or something little, I forget. And the dad was like, oh, man, no, you can't have the snake in the car. Like, you got to get rid of it. We're not taking the snake home. And so the kid very craftily, like, fakes getting rid of the snake, but still keeps it in his pocket, you know. And so they're driving back home and the kid is like, hey, 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 you know, I got my snake. Pocket yeah. snake. Pocket snake. Ow. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> so they they roll up to like a I'm trying to remember what they start seeing things outside they're like why are there are those like balloons floating around that's really weird because I think it was nighttime and they're like why are there balloons floating by and then they they stop and I think the balloon thing the thing they think is a balloon I think it attack, tries to attack the car and they're like, oh, sh oh fuck, we got to stop. And so they pull into like, I forget if it's a gas station or like a um, like a toll booth, something like that. And, you know, clearly something is horribly wrong. These things are not balloons. They're like tentacled floating creatures. Okay. Which is horrifying. And the dad tells the kid to stay in the car and he runs into the I had toll booth or convenience store or gas station, whatever it is with this teenager and the teenager just like gives him shit about being gay. I don't even know how it comes up. Like I don't like how do you have the capacity in that moment in time when you are battling otherworldly creatures to be like, "Oh, you're fucking gay. That's <laughs> lame." Like what? I just I found it so hilariously ridiculous that I remember laughing and being like, "Did this other really left this in here?" I just I just couldn't buy it. Just it was fucking stupid. Um, hey, man, defending yourself from balloon tentacle creatures sounds pretty gay. <laughs> yeah. So it was that really took me out of the story. I was just like, I don't believe that this would actually happen. It just does not make a lick of sense. Why would that be a topic of conversation when y'all are fighting tentacle horrors? Is that the point of the story is like sometimes people will just all of a sudden like bring that up about you in the weirdest situations where like how is that relevant right I, now? I don't know. It was I it felt clumsy and out of place to me. In Listen, any case, I'm trying to pop this tentacle balloon thing right now. As far as like, do who cares? Yeah. Man? And so in any case, they're obviously like, oh god, these are unknown horrors. We don't understand the the shitty teenager gets gets eaten, and the way these things kill you is they slowly peel off your skin, uh, like in l one long ribbon starting from wherever they can grab you. So pretty horrifying. Um, and the dad figures out that somehow he figures, oh, right, because the kid gets out of the car, the, the kid is blind, the son, and I... I don't remember. Oh, I think he gets out of the car because he can like tell something's wrong. And he's like, what the fuck's going on? And he gets out. And the dad's like, no, no, no. But then he realizes the tentacle creatures aren't attacking the kid. And he's like, oh, it must be because this, my son's blind. And so his decision is to gouge his own eyes out instead of just covering his eyes. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. Wait, wait. Was it? Wait, snake factors into this somehow. Yeah. The, the snake... snake Oh no, he he uses the snake to bite his eyes. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's why it was you even worse. The snake to be very specific. Okay. I he gets the snake to bite his hey, eyes. Hey, snake here, here, right there. I'm gonna put a little bit to, of meat to, right there. Yeah, to lose his vision. And again, my question is: Why not wrap the snake around your head? Yeah, why? Yeah, put. Why not just cover your eyes? I don't. 
because I, I, well, I guess in that instance, like, you don't want to take the chance that that's not going to be enough. So you, you get the snake out and I... I, oh, right. The point is the kid got out of the car. The snake escaped. The snake slithered over to where the dad was. Sorry. I, I read this many months ago. Right, I mean, we don't really have to summarize every last <laughs> anyway. bit of this story. Like, we were like last 10 minutes on this one story. <laughs> I here. just want to talk about how fucking stupid it was, Chris. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. I, I appreciate that we need the context there. Okay. You've well explained why you don't like the tentacle balloon uh. snake eye bite <laughs> teenager calls you gay in a phone booth story. <laughs> Sorry, it was just reliving it. It really is a how confluence of odd things to put together. Yeah, not good. Um, oh no, I'm stuck in an ad in my book app. Oh, sorry, I gotta wait until this is over. Okay, while you're doing that, I forgot to mention a book that I read this year that I liked. Are right, you going? Like 15 seconds. Go. Okay, it was called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. My partner gave it to me to read. It was about two people that were video game developers that met when they were young kids. And they, like, create video games together. And it's basically just about sort of this tension and push and pull of, like, this long-term creative friendship between opposite sex friends, which I found relatable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I thought it was an interesting look at how... Be because it was a story about friendship. It was explicitly, like, this, there is no romance happening here between oh, those two. Yeah, yeah. And it was just about a friendship and the ups and downs that come with that, especially when it's a creative partnership. So that was an interesting story that I wish there was more types of that kind of story around. And it took place in Boston partially, too. Oh, so, weird. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, great. All right. My book app is free of the, the <laughs> ad. Um, next one I read in October, uh, Babel by R.F. Kuang um, or Quang. I'm actually not sure how to say that. Uh, well, it's called Babel or On the Necessity of Violence. I gave this a soft four. Uh, this was recommended to me by my dental hygienist. Uh, love, love it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have a really cool dental hygienist. We talk about, or we, I, 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 I do this about you books and her it. while she uh, cleans my teeth and tells me about books. So it's pretty good. All right. This is my review of Babel. Um, great magic system construction. Love the emphasis on language and colonialism. Also enjoyed the, uh, spoiler, Spoilers! Spoilers! Also enjoyed the not happy ending and the author's commitment to killing main characters. Even further, I loved the focus on Chinese and all the footnotes and carefully careful history inclusions. Still, there was something about it that kept me from loving it. I think it was the feeling that it was a step between YA and an adult book somehow. I'm having a hard time describing what it was, but good enough for now. That was literally what i wrote right. <laughs> um, so Babel, much shorter than describing each story yeah. bit by bit well i think the problem with Babel for me is i just really don't like kids in magic school i just yeah never i'm real want tired of that, that. i, I was, never want just... it i didn't like harry potter when it came I, out when i was I'll seven even say <laughs> if it has to do with going to a special school i probably am that's yeah, probably I'm why out. i wasn't into I'm that out. gladiatorial thing because it was yeah. also slightly like special school for it and I, yeah. I don't know like you would think as an educator I'd be like all about that but actually I'm just like I, they, this is stupid they wouldn't have a special school I, I think I just don't like books about about adolescence about like kids and stuff I don't know there's just something about that that I'm like no I, I don't I don't know something about kids and school and magic school I just nah that being said if you are going to read about kids in a magic school, make it this fucking book. Don't read any of that other dumb horse shit out there about kids in magic schools because it's not going to be as good as this. This author, the work that she put into this is fucking incredible. She has, oh, well, she almost has two PhDs. Maybe she's graduated by now, but she has PhDs in like Chinese history and language and it shows God to, the I'd detail say, in this. Is, I thought you were about to say Harry Potter. She has a PhD no, in Harry no, 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 no. <laughs> And, and it's not it's not childish in the way it's written or anything. It just there, there's something about the feel of the writing that leaves left me a little wanting, but wonderfully constructed. I mean, oh, this book had some thick ass footnotes. We know how much I love Ooh, me a footnote. Turn, turning me off. Oh, I love it. Um, Stop getting off on your weird feet pick. Thing. <laughs> weird feet, feet notes. notes. Uh, <laughs> I love uh, all the history in it. I mean, the way and the world that she created that is just sort of a a few degrees off from our current world. So perfect. So well done. The way that racism and colonialism are addressed and the way that racism and colonialism are carried on through language is so good. Um, 
really, really, really love that. The magic system is interesting. I think it makes as much sense as you can make with the magic system. The whole deal uh, with the magic in Babel is that it is based on silver. Uh, and language. Like that jade Silver thing. and language. Well, no, not quite. So there, I, I think it works because people that have the ability to use magic and do the silver working, um, they, you have to come from a place where you know more than one language. So you have to sort of have this experience and be, and be taken out of it at a particular time. So it, it's very specific. It's not like, not everybody can do silver working or work with words in these ways. Well, that was specific also in the book that I mentioned Jade City. Oh, yeah. Not everyone can use Jade. So it's like also a specific thing. But this sounds like there's an extra component where it's yeah. not just magic stone make you power. Right. It's like there's a translational element. Yeah. So there's silver bars and depending on the grade of silver and I mean, there's a lot of variables, but essentially you have silver bars and then you inscribe a word on each side in two different languages that have a related meaning, but that aren't exact translation. And the power comes from that loss. Um, mm. And it's a really fascinating way to that think about. That is intriguing. Yeah. I really, really loved that. So there's a lot about this book I loved, but there was just something that kind of left me at the end being like, I don't know, you know, it didn't, didn't have a happy ending, which I love, you know me, I want that realistic, painful bullshit at the end. I want main characters to be murdered. Like it had all of that. Um, I don't know. There were, there was something about the writing that felt a little restrained. And I think that's what kept me from really falling for it. But I did really like it. I would absolutely recommend it again. Don't read other stupid fucking magic school books. Harry Potter, get the fuck out. Babel is where it's at. I like a ma so. Let me ask you this: When you do that sort of trans, like the the lost magic kind of thing, mm -hmm. is it always like if you put these two different words on one side, it'll always have the same effect, or is it like a little bit different? Is it like wiggly in that way? Um, no. Once somebody comes up with a pairing, it'll always okay. You know that pairing works that way, but the person who's inscribing it has to have the requisite level of skill and understanding of both of the languages so that it works. They, they can come up with right. like I understand that there's this right. loss here and that you can pull that out. That's intriguing to me because I, yeah. again, the thing about Harry Potter and re related stuff like that is like there's the one spell that always works the same way. It does the same thing. It's not that not much skill in like coming up with new. Yeah. Fuck that shit. Things are like I I like it when there's this wiggly area of like, but what if we tried this? What if we tried like how I don't like it to be quite so concrete. Yeah, and so even though this takes place in sort of uh the in the time of the opium wars, so this is sort of Victorian Victorian slash Edwardian, maybe? Ooh, actually I'm not I don't quite remember the exact year. Um uh I should just ugh, fuck. Oh well, it's a physical book, so I, I can't I can't check on it right now, but even though it's in that time period, the focus is really on kids who grow up in different, you know, who are of a, a different culture and are and the hegemonic white Western culture is trying to absorb them and take from them. And, you know, these are the kids who have that power. They've grown up in, you know, speaking Cantonese or Mandarin and English, and therefore they are of much value to the institution. And. Um, of course, the school that they all go to is Babel, uh, right? Uh, or, well, I forget. It actually has a different name, but they call... But Babel is like the language section where all the language scholars go. Anyway, I think... Uh, Sounds interesting. I think Rebecca Kwong, or Quang, sorry, I don't quite know how to pronounce it, is a fantastically brilliant author. And I'm um, really... I'm looking forward to reading other stuff she has written. Um, but, yeah, I think I just have this sort of... I don't know. So little something about it that I didn't I didn't like but I would still heartily recommend it and I think it was it was brilliantly constructed oh and it started with a preface that was like here's all the historical stuff I changed or moved and this is why and I was like fucking thank you thank <laughs> That's you your shit. that is extremely your shit yes I just because so many authors will be like well it's my world so I do whatever I want and it's like okay yeah but like a, tell me that you changed it, and B, tell me why. And this author did that, and it was so refreshing to open a book and be like, okay, cool, I get it. 
you're like, yeah, I moved this building here. I moved up the timeline of this rail system here because, I don't know, I needed them to go from one place to another. And in this world, it's a little different. You really Makes just sense. want the acknowledgement. You really yes. just want someone to stand there and say, to... this is why, yes. okay? This is why, the... well, because I want those decisions to be deliberate, to be considered, and to fit into the overall work and not just feel like random, I'm throwing darts at the dartboard to make this different. You know, I fucking hate that shit. Anyway. Babble, check it out. All right, All I right. got more. Oh God, <laughs> I got. Um, Can we like really snappy this one? Because we still have to talk about like other types of media, unless you want to cut this off at books. Yeah, I mean, I I only have one other one that I really loved, so most of these will be quick. Um, I read. Can we focus on the I, To I, Wallow in Ash and Other Sorrows by Sam Richard? I gave it two stars, and that was generous. This was really bad. These are stories you write but don't publish. Editing was lacking, and no character was impactful. Stories were dull, even when the ideas were genuinely scary. Lots of lazy writing. Feel really bad about this one, because I guess this dude wrote this book right after his wife died, and so a lot of the stories are about a dead, you know, losing your wife at in her 30s. I mean, it's it's sad, and I feel really bad, like, you know, kicking an author when they're down, but this was this was not good. This should not have been published. Um, yeah, it just was a total waste of time. It was pretty short, but don't read it. Next one, we've got uh, The Witch's Garden by Sandra Lawrence. Uh, this is a two star for me. This is the other one that I unfortunately picked up from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. <laughs> uh, so what I had to say about this is Beautifully assembled, but ultimately a bland read with some outdated and inaccurate quote-unquote facts. For example, Urgot or Ergo uh, did not cause the Salem witch hysteria, which is like a myth that was floated around for a while. This book was too surface level and general to be a guide to plants. Most descriptions just tell you what the plants were thought to do, but rarely confirms what, if any, real effect the plants have. Waste of time. Very pretty little book. All right. And then I read... Oh, I forgot I read this. Uh... <laughs> I actually read one of um, Olivia's books, OF Sierra. Uh I think we've, uh, Olivia's been on Antiques Freaks a few times. I read uh, their book, or her book, Lockdown Laureate. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I, I had just finished another book and I was on a plane and I still had a couple hours and I was like, what do I have on my phone? And then I realized I had this that um, Olivia had very uh, graciously gifted us. So I started reading it without having any idea what it was, <laughs> which was maybe a mistake. But as it continued, I was like, oh, OK, I get what's happening here. Um, basically, it's like it's just a bunch of little vignettes about different kinds of people in New York City. But it's, you know, it's kind of gritty and it's got it's got some it's got some darker vibes. Um, I gave it three and a half stars and I thought it was pretty good. It was really short. I thought the language was great. Editing was good. So if you're into just sort of like dark and a little bit dirty vignettes about people in a big city, check it out. I don't know if there was, I didn't sense a greater connection, but um, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Decent. You've got a couple hours to kill. Um, and lastly, the book I loved the most, uh, close second to Babel while I was off was Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo. This was a work book club pick and goddamn, do I have a lot of good things to say about this book, but I'll keep it brief because Chris wants to run away and our Indian food is nigh. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I believe it's already here. I gave this four and a half stars. This is pretty close to a five. This was a short story about 105 pages about a neuroscience researcher who studies wolves and she's having marital strife at home with her wife and God, Lee Mandelo just packed so much shit into 105 pages. This is what I had to say. Excellent characterizations and themes. Characters were very realistic and a lot was done for the reader in a very short time. Nothing was weird or nonsensical or out of line for a person to do. The science was futuristic enough, but still believable. The queerness was centered without being othering. Would read any of Mandelo's stuff again in a heartbeat. So Lee Mandelo, check his shit out. Feed Them Silence was so good. Um... They, like, there's, like, again, we're talking 105 pages and somehow we get these really great character portraits of the scientist, Sean, and her wife, Rhea. And Sean is definitely 
I would say a pretty unlikable character, and yet you're still invested in the book, which is a fucking hard thing to do. It's something we've talked about a lot on the show about how it can be really tough to to get that get that in there, especially in a short book. Um, there's, you know, um, ethical science stuff that comes up with the way they're studying the wolves. The notable thing in this is that it is the weirdly. This book takes place in Minnesota, and I was actually flying to Minnesota when I started it, and I didn't know that. No, you're going to get fed <laughs> so, the silence. Oh, no. Uh, so that was kind of fun. Um, it takes place at the U of M, University of Minnesota, in the near future. It doesn't specify a date, but it feels like probably within the next 20, 30 years. Not you know? to interrupt you two here, but like sure. noticing that I got the, the little mild kick out of like this book tape takes place in boston you were like oh it's going to minnesota is there a word for that feeling when you're reading someone's like oh that's where me is i'm sure there's a german <laughs> word for it but yeah. not an english one um <laughs> listeners if do you know what what word is for that weird funny feeling of like oh this is occurring where i also physically am existing yay yay it's <laughs> it's fun um anyway it me place <laughs> yes i don't know it was just sort of a fun coincidence yes. And in any case, uh, the science in the book specifically, again, this is we're talking eh, 10 to 30 years, probably 20, 30 years in the future. So still sort of modern, but a little a little more advanced. This researcher has <clears throat> gotten funding from a corporate entity to test this uh, neural mesh. So they implant neural mesh into this wolf. Of course, they have to like trank and do surgery on an animal without its consent obviously which is you know dicey mm -hmm. especially because it's like not to benefit the animal it's like we just want to link up brains and so that's the... supposedly what elon's up to with the monkeys right so fuck that shit yeah fuck elon <laughs> musk god um <clears throat> and so the researcher also has neural mesh implanted in her brain so they she what the mesh allows them to do in all this like software and, and lab shit that they have going on is she can kind of experience experience what the wolf's experiencing for 10 minutes at a time because at that point they don't know how safe it is so she has all these episodes of going going into the wolf and warging yeah <clears throat> warging shitty warging um and sean the neuroscientist sean's whole life she's always been like fascinated with wolves and always kind of nursed this like selfish desire that i think a lot of people have to sort of be a wolf right or to be an animal that you really like and like oh man i get to be an animal i get to like be one with them and like be their best friend or whatever so it's very misplaced right like <laughs> this is like not not the way you should be thinking about this stuff um and she knows that but she's still like you know nah, this is still how i feel so she has all these experiences with the wolf who i think she names kate i think she nicknames oh, the wolf kate. kate the wolf kate the wolf and you know the this this uh, this wolf pack is the last wolf pack, so that's the oh. other thing. <laughs> you know, that sounds like a really bad metal album. Yeah. The last wolf pack. Riding with the boys. Anyway, it's you know environmental degradation, climate change, etc. Um, so it's really important that they study them, and they're really concerned that the wolves are actually starving to death because there's not a lot of food out there. So life is rough for the wolves, and there's a lot of that. But then at home, you know, Sean and her wife are not having a great time because Sean is so self-absorbed and there's all this this tension about like, oh, but we're the perfect academic couple, like two lesbians, you know, being cool with our different interests. I forget what Rhea's um, field of study is. I actually don't know that it's ever, it's ever said. Um, there's also racial tensions because Rhea is uh, from India and Sean is just, I don't know, generic white 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 dude butch lesbian i guess um and there's the discussion there's like some queer stuff going on where ria's like you're you're such a butch lesbian that you've like taken on all these shitty characteristics of like a cishet white dude like what the fuck you know like you expect me to be home and clean and cook like this sucks and um their strife is just really well presented the characters are really fleshed out it really again just, just jams so much stuff in here so you've got like medical and science ethics and like gay relationships and like non-human animal and human relationships and fucking i don't know it's great impressive it was great. read for it a, a little bit over 100 pages yeah i cannot wait to read lee mandela's other stuff um i looked it up and he's got um a bunch of books also i mean he himself is a queer author um he's a uh, i think he's trans trans man i think um and like just also just the 
and again, the, the queerness isn't othered and it's also not spotlighted awkwardly, you know? It's really just normal. There's also a non-binary character that's just totally normal, like normalized, very, very, very well done, expertly written, um, really masterful short story. So feed them silence, check it out. Woo! All right. That's all the books we read yeah. <laughs> that Honestly, weren't terrible book club books. I do have other good media to discuss, but perhaps that's for another time at this point because we've been going already for like we, an hour time. We just can't shut the fuck up, Paris. That's yeah. just our brand. I, well, I actually, I didn't realize how many... I guess I didn't realize how many books we each had read. This year. Honestly, I read more because I was trying to carve out all the stuff that I just didn't like. I was oh. trying to keep it very light and positive <laughs> generally the whole time. I had except a lot that of... one about Brandon Sanderson. Well, I feel like I had to bring that up because I was I'm generally like, yeah, Stormlight Archives. No, so fuck. I, to... I fucking don't like Brandon Sanderson. Okay, well, great. <laughs> Sorry. But... <laughs> I feel like I, I'm contractually obligated to say that because everyone I know is like, Brandon Sanderson is so good. And like, I've read... I forget he's what I read of his good. books. Like, this sucks. I wouldn't say so good. He's good. Like, he's fine. He like, is the most fucking average, tepid fantasy shit. Like, I... Uh, uh, it's a little bit above tepid. It's like a little warm. <laughs> it's like lukewarm. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, I mean, sometimes I just want magic swordy fighting. No, see, I don't. I can't do it. I ha- I only have so much time on this earth, Chris. I, and even less for reading with terrible book true i think you know this is my genre where i'm like yeah i'll do whatever and like yeah i would never i i am not on the level of some brandon sanderson fans where they're like he's the best writer ever he has such an intricate yeah, interconnect I know. the cosmere I, like every time i look up all that lore behind the cosmere i'm like this is dumb so i feel I like these are <laughs> these are people who haven't read malazan these are people who haven't read steve Harris, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna blow your head off with this like Malazan absolutely way better with the deep lore in yeah. every ways. No shit. Yeah. I can't sit through most of those books. I know. I know they're very particular and super nerdy and I get that they're not for everybody, but if you're going to talk about masterful worlds and all that Agree. shit, then get fucked, Brandon okay. Sanderson I fans. do I do like me a Memories of Ice. <laughs> memories of Ice yeah, was Yeah, give me that really, ice. Oof, that we remember really, it. <laughs> that was a really good one. <laughs> Okay, we'll talk about some other good media at some other point, I suppose. Maybe yeah. we'll have like a video games and movies and TV. We were also going to talk about like our accomplishments this year, but now we have to eat Indian food. So I guess that's also going to have to wait. Yeah, honestly, I feel like that should be a regularly scheduled like when we start the new season. Because who knows? I don't know if this is Patreon only or if we put this. On no, the I was just going to put it out for funsies. All right. Well, happy holidays, y'all. You know, like, yeah. here's a little extra. Like, last year, we didn't we watch that terrible film? Was that the year before? We did some extra bonus holiday thing at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I here's figured, another one. Here you go. Some positivity is is to be had in here. Anyway, Dark Prophet saga I really enjoyed. Uh, China Me Avails the Scar, general thumbs up. Some other fantasy stuff that I mentioned before. Yeah, it's pretty fine, but I'm not going to like shout it from the rooftop. Tomorrow, 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 a very good look at creative friendships, which is something that I... I crave more stories about. I um, I'm not gonna go back through everything I said because it was a lot. Yeah. you can you. This is a medium in which you can pause and rewind. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. You know, I you summarized. I was a little bit shorter. You got all Paris's ideas out there anyway. So anyway, happy holidays. Try to enjoy yourselves. Don't wallow in the terribleness all the time with us here. Go out and have a good time. Find something pleasurable. It's not healthy to complain and bitch and moan all the time. Take it from us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we do that for most of the year. Uh, anyway. Yeah, it's- we just sort of wanted to give you a little, yeah, little extra thing for the holidays. We hope you're having a good time, um, and hopefully your families aren't too oppressive, and you get to enjoy your if time off if you get that this time of year. Not everybody does. Um, Self care. Have a relax. Read a book. Yeah, have a bath. That's how I started this year's reading for season nine. As I said, Chris, I'm starting. I'm very sad. This was a few days ago, and I said, but I'm going to take a bath about it. So I took a bath and started reading. Um, a terrible book for next season and it was less terrible i always just do it at night while my partner is asleep next to me and just like i'm like hunched over my phone like making sure the light isn't waking her up and i'm just like in my own little <laughs> terrible pretty world bad. and eventually i can't stand it anymore and i'm like sleep is better than this it's how i cure my insomnia <laughs> oh yeah i guess that'll do it uh but in any case yeah we just sort of wanted to throw an extra thing on the calendar for y'all since we pre-recorded everything so early we figured it'd be fun to you know do something in the fall and let you have this before the year is out but we are 
hard at work on season nine. In fact, tomorrow in our timeline, <laughs> we are recording a bunch of episodes. Um, so can't wait. Uh, Back uh, to the shit pile. Yeah, it's Get already your shovel. Paris, <laughs> take the shovel. I just want to say... take the shovel. It's time. It's I take the okay, shovel, Paris. I'm taking the shovel. All right. The shovel. See you tomorrow. Uh, see you tomorrow, Chris. Happy holidays, y'all. Thank you so much for listening to TBC. And we wish you a good book, a good media, a happy holiday winter time. And we will see you very soon for season nine. Hail to Reba. Hail to Reba. Hail! Hail! Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris, with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terrible book club. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terrible book club. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com.